For me, water features give a garden more wow factor than any other element. Don't get me wrong, the right kind of planting scheme can fill you with awe, carefully positioned sculpture can really make a garden memorable. But nothing has the power to lift a garden from average to gold medal winning more than water. Yeah, water features can be quite dominant when it comes to uh, designing them and so often they end up getting either left out or reduced to nothing more than a glorified bird bath. So today I thought I'd upload this video so that in 20 minutes time you can embrace this element and hopefully love water as much as I do within the garden. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Water runs downhill. Forgive me for stating the obvious, but as well as being the first lesson that you learn at plumbing school, this fundamental is absolutely crucial to any kind of water feature where there's movement. Now the use of a pump can push water upwards and then we can allow gravity to let it fall back down. Once we understand this and embrace it and know how to manipulate this idea, we can design any kind of water feature that you might have seen. So take this most basic kind of water feature, a pump within a reservoir or a pond pushes the water out of the pond or the reservoir and then allows it to fall back down into this body of water. A relatively simple idea. And here's another great example of this huge water feature designed by Sarah Eberle at uh, RHS Chelsea in 2021. It's part of the Psalm 23 garden. Now this same idea can be used in any kind of water feature really, uh, whether it be a rill, a water blade, a waterfall, uh, a, a, a globe or, or basic type of water feature which is a fountain within a pond like these most amazing fountains uh, to be found in Rome. An alternative to this type of uh, water feature with movement could just be a simple reflection pool. In the right part of a garden, these can look great reflecting the sky or the light. Um, in other places, you might want to dye them black so as to really enhance their re reflective qualities. And so building on this most fundamental idea, um, I thought that uh, it might be useful for us to look at three individual water features, how they're designed, how they're built, um, and how they've used these concepts that we've been talking about. We're going to start with the most basic, uh, simple, off-the-shelf kind of water feature. We're going to look at something fairly interim that can be incorporated into most gardens. And then I'm going to finish off by looking at a water feature I designed for a show garden a few years ago. Uh, one of the biggest features that I've ever designed. Okay, so let's start with the water globe. Now, uh, a water globe is something that you can probably buy at a garden centre, certainly off the internet. Um, it's a self-contained kit which comprises of three key elements. Um, you have a reservoir within the ground or above ground, uh, if you want to put it on a patio. Um, obviously, we want to try and disguise that reservoir, so you might want to plant around it. Uh, we quite often use pebbles or rocks or boulders over the top of it, so you don't know the reservoir's there. Um, within that reservoir, there's a grid on that. Uh, within that reservoir, there is a pump um, with a pipe that then will lead up through uh, the globe that, uh, that, that, that's supplied with this. Now, this is a stainless steel globe, um, but the concept uh, could be the same if you had, say, a large slate monolith. is something that you often see in garden centres as well. Um, the idea that the pump simply grabs the water within the reservoir, pumps it up the pipe, it then flows over the globe or whatever it is that's on top and then back down into the reservoir, recycling it. And this is a very efficient type of water feature, often not particularly expensive um, and can look great if it's combined with the right kind of planting or something else that's around it. Um, certainly the, uh, the globes that we use, the stainless steel ones are good because they create reflection, they're great for kids, they can put their hands all over it which is quite fun. The slate monoliths can obviously look uh, perhaps a bit better in a more natural si uh, situation. Next, uh, one that we use an awful lot of uh, is a water blade. Now, uh, some people might call this a waterfall, but uh, it's effectively a blade, uh, often made from stainless steel, that can sit within a wall or some, or be attached to the face of a wall. Um, water is pumped up from a reservoir of sorts. Now, this reservoir has to be a little bit bigger because it's going to drop in a different way. It's not going to run over anything. It's literally just going to fall down through the air. Um, we quite often position these on a pond uh, or on the edge of a, a, of a large contemporary pool. Um, within the pond or pool, uh, we're going to hide a pump somewhere. Now again, this can be within rocks, it can be underneath gravel, what have you. Um, see that quite a bit. Um, that pump is then going to take water, pump it up through a pipe around the back of the wall or up uh, inside sometimes, you see it within a wall, um, into this channel. 
The channel then fill, it has like a very, very small reservoir uh, just underneath the blade. That fills up and then flows over evenly um, into uh, the, the reservoir um, below. Um, this can look particularly effective if you use multiple smaller uh, blades or maybe one large blade. They often come in uh, sort of 30 centimeter, 60, 90, uh, maybe even 1.2 meters wide. Um, and sometimes they don't have to just be a simple blade. Sometimes as uh, with this example, uh, there is a curved option. Um, and you can incorporate those uh, into, uh, say for instance, boulders like that first example I showed you, um, or uh, even just dropping into different types of, of reservoir can be particularly effective. Um, this is a really good um, contemporary modern type uh, feature, works particularly well with lighting. Any light that's shining up into the blade is gonna be carried with the water um, and shine up the surface behind it. Now you'll notice with those last two uh, examples that I've given you, uh, the concept and the uh, and the principles behind it are very much the same you have a you have a body of water you have a pump the pump takes the water to another location and that water then is allowed to flow back to uh, that reservoir it's pretty much the same with most water features i can't really think of many that don't incorporate that in one way or another um, but this next water feature um, sort of really pushed this idea um, to the limit however uh, please note the fundamentals are exactly the same um, back in 2017, I designed and uh, we built as a company the Cruise Bereavement Care Garden uh, at RHS Chatsworth. Um, this garden was based around the concept of terminal illness. Cruise Bereavement Care are, as they say, um, a bereavement counselling service uh, that offer um, help to those who've lost somebody. Um, and the idea of uh, terminal illness was one that was particularly close to us at the time, as I'd recently, uh, the year before, lost my father-in-law, my wife's father, um, sadly to pulmonary fibrosis. Now, this was quite an emotional garden and I really wanted to do it justice. So thought very carefully and decided that water would be a great way to um, talk about this, this, this concept of, of terminal illness. Um, it started with a large block of stone, water being pumped up through it, just like I talked about with the water globe, and then overflowing this stone back down into the reservoir. Um, the idea behind that being this was very much about when you found out about somebody who had terminal illness that was close to you, this emotion bubbling up into uh, all parts of your life. Um, from there, um, the water then uh, went down a stainless steel uh, rill. This was 11 meters long, which was quite a challenge um, to put in the structure for that. But from a design perspective, it was literally just a channel of two, uh, uh, 200 millimeters um, wide by about 100 millimeters deep, made from stainless steel, which we had fabricated um, by a uh, steel fabricator. Uh, and then fitted on site. At one end we had a, a hole where um, we could use a, a pipe and there was a connector that we had from a local um, water feature supplier um, and this connected that and gave it a watertight seal. And at the other end um, we had a blade uh, type uh, finish um, welded to the other end uh, so that we could have a reservoir underneath this to catch it. So the water would effectively be pumped up from the reservoir um, all the way along uh, quite a large pipe through uh, the bottom of this uh, rill, and then that would channel down to the reservoir um, at the other end, so again, recycling. So we had two separate and individual water features doing a very similar job, um, but were connected. Um, we, we, we sealed these together and planted around them in a way that it looked like they were part of the same feature. Um, at the other end where uh, the water feature um, uh, or, or the water rill emptied out into, um, we then placed a reflection pool uh, over the top of this. This was a four metre wide um, powder coated black steel tank effectively that was open to the top. Um, the idea was that terminal illness um, as, it go, as it goes through life obviously takes a, a sometimes is shorter, sometimes it's a longer period of time, but along uh, the, the, the route there are rocky parts. Uh, we, we simulated this by literally putting in some rocks so that it would create rougher water and then some smoother areas where um, there was time to sort of spend with family. But in the end, this disappeared into a period of reflection. Um, and uh, this particular um, reflection pool was literally just that, a steel reservoir filled with water. We dyed this black um, 
primarily because we wanted to really enhance the, the, the white flowers and some of the green planting around it so that we got a really strong reflection there because it was uh, the idea of being left with just the memories of, of, of the person that we'd, we'd, we'd lost. Um, you don't have to dye the water black when it comes to a reflection pool. It can just be standard um, uh, sort of water as it is um, in the right place uh, this can be fantastic we've got um, one garden that we, we created a reflection pool within um, and uh, the client said it's, it's wonderful at night when the moon is out because it reflects the light of the moon onto the ceiling within the kitchen um, so you can create those um, effects sometimes perhaps uh, not intentionally um, but by dyeing the water black um, you also reduce the, the the issue of algae which I'll come on to in a little bit um, because it's not allowing light into the water which which can be a, a, another benefit so going back to this water feature at, uh, at Chatsworth Flower Show, as I say, there were three independent water features that were connected and joined up so that they became one big water feature. This uh, attracted a lot of attention, um, primarily from the public. Uh, it was on television a little bit, and uh, certainly the suppliers were really pleased with what we'd done because it, it just gave that a little bit of... Uh, of, of different something a bit different um, but this is the thing with water features you know um, the actual concept of water running downhill and being pumped up is really all it comes down to after that it's just your ideas as a designer as to how you're going to make that interesting you know are you going to have one reservoir up really high that and, and and how is it going to get down to that bottom reservoir you know that's what it's really all about um, that could be a, a really long convoluted way maybe it goes through a, a, a down a big stream or something like that with lots of plants and things like that um, or maybe it is literally just a, a blade of water that falls into a, a, another pool and um, that is down to us as designers but the there's nothing overly complex about it. It's really just our creativity that, 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 that is holding us back. Now, clearly, with any water feature, there are little intricacies. It's not all about these basic uh, these basic concepts. There are little intricacies, um, and so what I want to talk about now a little bit, just for a couple of minutes, is specifying your water feature. Um, as a designer, it's all very nice to have these great ideas, these grand ideas. Um, if you've seen my video, How to Design a Garden, um, link just above there, um, if you haven't. Um, once we've got that initial concept idea within a design, we then need to put um, a bit more detail into it and certainly explain how we're going to build it. And it's the same with the water feature, you know, we have to explain how we're going to build this water feature, how's it going to look, how's it going to work, and what key components are we going to use. And this is the specification that we need to get right. Um, and this is probably the most complicated part, but it's not something that you should be scared of. Um, the reason I say that is because quite often a lot of suppliers um, will help you with it. You know, um, if you know you need a pump um, and you uh, go on the internet, let's say, for instance, or if you know uh, a supplier, um, you just simply need to get in touch with these suppliers. Um, Oase, a big uh, supplier of pumps within the UK, they'll happily advise you and talk to you about the type of pump that you're going to use. Um, I use a company called Landscape Plus who supply multiple different types and, uh, and brands um, of pumps and pipe work and various kit. Um, they're always on hand to talk to me about these things and, and, and quite often I'll send over a design and say look I really want to be able to get this water from one end of an 11 meter reel to another and be pumped back uphill and um, what size pump do I need to use? Now, on their website, there are these charts and graphs, um, and uh, they're, they're, they explain exactly what the flow rate is, um, how many litres per minute normally, um, uh, and it talks a little bit about um, gradients and heights, how high it will pump up. Certainly with a water blade, you need to be thinking very carefully about how high that water needs to be pumped up to make sure the pump's strong enough. But you know, if you're not great when it comes to maths or if you don't really uh, know what you're looking at or how many litres per minute you need, again, it's just a case of talking to these suppliers. Um, quite often, um, certain elements like water, uh, waterfall blades um, come as kits and they will specify the correct size pipe work and pump for you anyway. But if you don't know, it's just a case of simply contacting the supplier uh, and making sure you get this bit right because it really is important that you get the flow right too much is going to splash and you're going to lose lots of water um, or might even just shoot out rather than dropping down um, too little and all you're going to get is a bit of a dribble at best um, and that's going to be really disappointing for the client when they see that now as well as the pump you need to think about how you're going to hold these bodies of water you're going to have at least one reservoir uh, of some sort uh, somewhere where the water is going to be held now again within a simple water feature like a, a, a globe or a, a 
monolith of, of stone, um, you're often going to have a plastic or, or um, fiberglass type reservoir. Now this um, could be a certain size, again these kits are often specced for you so the correct size is there, but um, if you're going to move away from just an off-the-shelf type water feature, you need to think about how big that reservoir needs to be for a start um, and what it's going to be made from. Now, plastic reservoirs are great. Um, they tend to be limited in terms of their size because obviously they're, they're, they're going to move and twist. You quite often have to specify them on something solid. So if you're putting it within the ground, you might want to put it on some concrete um, or at least something solid, maybe a better stone. Um, it's what weight is going to be sitting on that, that, that reservoir and again it's about just making inquiries and making sure you get the right um, type of reservoir if you're getting a plastic one uh, that will sustain that kind of, or, or hold that kind of weight. Um, we do a lot where we create a pond or a reservoir using concrete block work. So we'll put a concrete footing in, we'll build block work around it. Um, and then we'll either use a pond liner, now we might use a, a rubber pond liner, or um, we might use um, a fiberglass liner of some sort. Now, fiberglass has to be done on site normally with something like that that's bespoke. So we might line the, the, the block work and then fiberglass it on the site. Uh, this works really well when you have intricacies and different heights, levels, so if you want shelves on a pond, um, or if it's a, a bit of an awkward shape, uh, fiberglass works particularly well. Um, and it's fairly hardy. One, once it's gone in and you know that it's, it, it, it's been done properly, um, it tends to last really well. And if you do get cracks or breaks, these can be repaired. So fiberglass is a great option. Um, there are other uh, ways of doing this, which uh, we don't need to go into in great depth, but um, I know uh, G4 Pond Seal is another option. You render a pool and then you paint it on. Um, that's okay so long as the render and the, the block work doesn't crack. Uh, um, but again, all we're trying to do is create a body of water. Um, and how we go about this is, 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 is crucial. You as a designer should be able to decide um, what type of liner you want to go for. Again, you might want to talk to a landscaper about that, um, get their advice or the supplier of uh, the kit that you, you're using. Um, experience will tell you after a while uh, what's best. We sometimes consider um, the weather as well. If we're building a garden in the winter, I might try and avoid fiberglass because temperatures might cause us problems and certainly um, you can't do it in the rain and things. So if I can get away with some sort of liner, um, I probably will. Um, sometimes you can get these uh, what are called box welded liners as well where um, you give the dimensions of uh, the pool that you're creating. If it's a rectangle, it's dead easy. Um, and they will actually make that liner for that pool. So it'll have the corners welded for you so that you're not trying to fold all the liner in, which is particularly difficult, especially in the cold. Then, as I say, once you've uh, got the reservoir right, it's about what goes on top, what sort of size blade you want, uh, what's that made from. We need to touch on a little bit about metal. Um, if you're going to use metal outside, it really does need to be stainless steel. Um, you can use copper. Copper looks great in water features. Certainly, I've seen a lot of Chelsea Flower Show water features using copper. The only thing I would say with copper is that after a while, that's going to go green. Um, which again can look fantastic, but you have to uh, probably worth making a few inquiries um, with the suppliers of the pumps. I know that copper can cause problems to the rubber seals within pumps and cause them to degrade quite quickly. Um, so that's worth thinking about. Um, but uh, stainless steel is is a really good one, and there's two. Uh, there's, there's usually um, two types of uh, stainless steel. Um, there's a uh, just an external stainless steel, and then there's a marine grade stainless steel. These come with numbers uh, attached to them. Um, marine grade stainless steel is usually the best when it comes for outdoor use, and certainly a water feature. Um, this also uh, the reason it's marine grade is because it will take salt water. Not that you're going to put salt into a water feature, but it, it tends to be a lot more resistant. To corrosion. Um, the last thing a client wants is a water feature that looks amazing, very contemporary to start with and within a year is rusting. Um, your supplier it's quite important and if you have bespoke water features put in um, you need to talk to the fabricator about the type of welding that they're doing to make sure that the weld isn't going to rust because it's all very well having some nice stainless steel but if the weld is, is then done in a way that that's going to rust that's it's, it's going to spoil it completely um, so yeah marine grade stainless steel is better but it is a little bit more expensive than external grade stainless steel which quite often these off-the-shelf water features will just be standard external grade and that's fine as long as you understand that it's going to have a slightly limited well more limited lifespan still pretty good lifespan but a slightly more limited lifespan than marine grade 
Okay, so uh, the last bit of uh, information that I'm going to share with you or, or, or the last part of the talk that I'm going to give is uh, really about problem solving and, and frequently asked questions, I think, when it comes to water features. So over the years, we've had uh, quite a few failures and problems, nothing we haven't been able to fix, um, but certainly challenges along the way over the last decade that have really helped me to um, have a wealth of knowledge to be able to pass on to you. Um, and when it comes to problems, uh, certainly no shortage of those. Um, the first and most obvious one when it comes to water feature is our uh, water leaks. Now, these tend to be from the reservoir. Um, this could be as simple as the, the reservoir is damaged, which obviously then it's nice and easy. You just have to replace it or fix it. Or if it's fiberglass, like I say, it can be uh, repaired. Um, but also, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways in which we found that um, you can lose water quite quickly is um, splash. Uh, and that is if you have a water wall or if you have a water blade or something where the water is going to hit maybe rocks, pebbles, um, or, or just the water surface itself, and there's going to be a certain amount of splashing, where is that splashing landing? You know, Because uh, if the splashing is landing outside of the liner, you've lost that water. Okay. Now, it might seem like, well, you see a few splashes, you think well, it's not really losing much water, but over the course of a whole day, uh, especially in the hot summer, you can lose several uh, several litres, if not um, tens of litres. Um, and uh, the problem with this is if the water level drops too low, the pump can then burn dry and then you can create an awful lot of damage. Um, so we need to try and avoid this loss of water through splash. Um, we had a garden that we uh, built, another garden for RHS Chatsworth in 2019, uh, where we had these water walls, um, and um, the water uh, flowed from a reservoir underground, it was pumped up into a reservoir uh, behind a wall, and then it was allowed to overflow down this beautiful black limestone, looked very much like slate, dropping into these pebble uh, pools which were, were planted. Um, however, uh, one of the challenges that we had was um, that as it was dropping down and hitting these pebbles, it was splashing all around. Um, we had made the liner quite a bit wider um, than the reservoir. However, the liner, when it um, uh, went over the flower beds, actually um, went downhill outside of the pool. So although the liner was catching the water, the water was then flowing out into the rest of the garden, which was great because we got to water the plant. So there was a lot less watering for me to do each night. And it wasn't so much of a major problem because the show was only open for five days uh, just involved topping up each day but if I had done that commercially for a, a, a client I can imagine that would have caused me quite a few uh, problems in terms of I would have had to go back and, 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 and fix that so we need to think about where the liner is and also that the liner is allowing the water to drain straight back down into that reservoir um, the next point when it comes to uh, loss of water is going to be evaporation. Um, we ha uh, we've, we've made quite a few of these water walls uh, for various people. The only thing I would say with these water walls is it's qu creating quite a, a thin sheet of water that goes over the surface. And if this is in direct sunlight, the wall that it's running down um, can sometimes get quite warm and cause evaporation. Same goes with any kind of splash or, like I say, those stainless steel globes uh, does the same. If it's in direct sunlight for a long period of time, the surface and the water can warm up quite quickly and you'd be amazed at how much loss of water you can have from evaporation. So position within a garden is really crucial and uh, perhaps um, elevation as well. You know, if we can get it so it's west facing or east facing rather than directly south, that might be worth uh, serious consideration when you're at the early stages of the design. Now, the final way I'm going to talk about when it comes to water loss, which uh, again, um, we found out very quickly on one pond uh, or one pool, um, and it's stuck in my uh, mind ever since. Um, it, 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 it's probably quite obvious uh, when you think about it, but when you have two reservoirs, one slightly higher than the other, and you pump from the lower reservoir to the top, this works really, really well until you turn the pump off. Um, when you turn the pump off, it tends to create a siphon. So what happens is if that pipe work is below uh, the water in the larger pool, in, in, sorry, in the higher pool, what will happen is when you turn that pump off, immediately it will go from pushing water to sucking water, and it will drain the top reservoir into the lower reservoir quite a lot of the time. Um, if the lower reservoir is not big enough to contain both pools of water, it will contain as much as it can and then it will just simply overflow. Uh, once it's overflowed, you've lost that water. You either have to top up that reservoir 
um, or, or it's when you turn it on next, it's simply going to fill that reservoir with whatever it's got in this pool. And once that pool is empty, that pump will burn dry. Um, and, and that may not even be at the point where it's overflowing. So this idea of uh, siphoning water when the pump is turned off is, is something that we need to think about. Um, there's a very easy solution for this, and that is a non-return valve. Um, non-return valve is, is as it sounds it allows water to go one way but it does not allow the water to return back through it um, the only thing I would say about non-return valves is you have to bear in mind that they slow the flow of water they, 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 they put a, a resistance in there um, we found again that what you, you tend to need to do is if you need a half inch pipe for instance um, in order to get enough water from uh, to create the flow that you want you actually have to change the pipe work to three quarter inch or even inch and have uh, an appropriate sized um, non-return valve so as to not affect the flow to the point where it's going to um, uh, cause you problems. Um, so non-return valves are a very quick and easy way of doing this. You don't tend to need it if the pipe work or the, the, the bit where the water is coming out is above water. Obviously it's not going to suck water back up. Um, the moment air gets into the pipe, it automatically stops that siphoning system. Um, so it's only really a problem when the, 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 the external flow is going underwater. Um, we do this quite a lot because you don't necessarily want to see pipe work, um, but the problem would be then it would drain back down. Um, and finally, water flow. Um, I think water flow is something that can sometimes be a bit tricky. Again, it depends on the pump. You can turn some pumps up and down, um, which can allow more or less water. You can also you get these uh, valves which have like taps on them as well to flow reducers and adjusters that can go in the pipe work. Again, you can turn them up and down. Um, anywhere where you're gonna have water shooting out, whether it be a blade or whether it be um, some sort of pipe work, uh, something like that, you probably wanna be able to control the water flow. So either you want to be able to test it um, and either uh, replace or, or adjust the size of the pump, or you want to have a uh, flow adjuster. Um, again, just word of warning on that is obviously if you reduce the flow too much on a pump, so if you have quite a large pump and you reduce it right down, that's gonna put pressure on the pump and it's gonna reduce its lifespan. And then algae uh, and uh, constant maintenance of water features. I can't go, uh, talk about water features without really touching on maintenance. Um, this is a real challenge and it's something that you need to, uh, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's gonna depend on you and the client and how much maintenance they want a lot of the time. Leave Leaves, detritus, anything within the garden can get into the water. This is going to need to be fished out. Um, we quite often treat our water features if they don't have plants in them so as to reduce the chance of algae. Um, you can use certain products like Fountain Clear, we use quite a lot that reduces, uh, sorry, increases the pH of, of the water um, and uh, stops anything from growing in it, but it's actually not harmful to wildlife. It just won't allow growth within it. Um, if that, it has limited uh, success if, if, if the pool gets particularly warm. And so sometimes you can uh, opt for like a bromine type system. Um, there's various other chemicals on the marketplace. The only thing I would say is be a little bit careful and cautious because obviously if there is any splash or if there's any water escaping um, or if you have wildlife within the garden you don't really want to be poisoning it um, so be very cautious about that um, swimming pool type chemicals can work but again we don't really want to be putting chlorine anywhere near um, the environment um, so yeah, we can use chemicals. Uh, alternatively, uh, if we're going for a, like a nature pond or a, a, a planted pond, um, you can get UV type filtration systems. Um, Filtral is one that Oase use, which is which is quite a good one. Goes on into the actual pond itself and sucks and filters the water through some sponges. And there's a UV light which kills the algae and keeps the water relatively clear. Again, if you specify the right uh, size. Fill trowel. These, these these tend to work really well. We use them quite a lot. Um, does require some maintenance from the client. They have to clean the, the sponges out quite regularly. Um, there are other high pressure type filters and UV um, filters that you can use. Again, talk to your supplier about what's what's best for your design feature once you've got that design um, ready. Um, and of course, if you get a pond right with the right type of plants, the right type of nature, you get the certain amount of oxygenation going on and movement and things like that, um, it, it can work really, really well. The, you're always gonna get a certain amount of algae or, or green life within um, a na natural pond, um, but that's part of the charm, I think, sometimes. Um, 
that is about as far as I'm going to go today on water features. Uh, who knows, might come back to this subject. I love water features, so uh, there is a good possibility that I'll come back and talk about something a little bit more specific. But I wanted to give you a bit of a, uh, an introduction to water features and how I think they work and how, how simple they can be. You just have to be brave um, and obviously do your research. Um, if you've enjoyed this, if it's worked well for you, please do give us a thumbs up and like us. Don't forget to subscribe um, if you aren't already. Um, I'll be back with another video in a couple of weeks. Uh, anything you want me to talk about, do please comment uh, and let me know. I'm always open to ideas. Otherwise, I hope you can get out in the garden in the next week. Otherwise, see you very soon.